the Connecticut Department of Social Services made this request specifically on a panel on, quote, mass migration preparedness. Eli, I think, if I'm reading this correctly, migrants are now being treated like weather events. <laughs> uh, folks, uh, tomorrow morning, between the hours of 8 and 11 a.m., uh, bring your umbrellas because it's going to be uh, raining uh, Nicaraguans, Mexicans, Hondurans, Afghans, 5% Chinese, uh, intermittently look out for the uh, big clouds full of buses from the south. Uh, you need to be prepared. This is, again, a all-hands-on-deck uh, warning for mass migration preparedness. Like, what? what is yeah. this language? Yeah, it's going to be like the new... Uh, trade winds you know that people used to use to cross the atlantic you know the trade winds in the global village we're gonna have a, a downpour of haitians on uh, in south texas <laughs> <laughs> board up your windows folks there is a uh, there uh, there's going to be a uh, strong winds carrying uh haitians uh, going through the town square between the hours of 1 and 4. Recording from the awesome Frontera Tech Law Studios in New Haven, Connecticut, it's the 10 Billion People podcast, where we talk about, in the most unorthodox way possible, about the issues of migration and global movement that are only getting harder as the world approaches 10 billion humans. Here are your hosts, Damian DeNoble and Eli McDonald. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 7 of 10 Billion People podcast. Um, good to be back. Good to be back. I really enjoyed our comments uh, Me too. on the podcast. So it turns out nobody's listening to the long form podcast except for our dearest friends and our parents. <laughs> but a lot of people have been checking out the shorts, right? And this is how we know. This is how I know that that uh, adage, which we keep hearing that nobody listens to long form but pretends to is true. Our shorts have gotten something like 100,000 views over the past yeah, yeah. two months, and we get lots of comments on Instagram, lots of comments on YouTube. And our long form has been fact-checked by my father. Yes, yeah. that's, that's correct. And, <laughs> Pete, and, 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 and my uh, great friend, Pete, yeah. who is um, this wonderfully brilliant man, academic, PhD in Chinese studies, and he's lived along the desert uh, you know, he lived in New Mexico, and uh, he was a trail guide on the Appalachian Trail, or the Rocky Mountain Trail, the big Pacific one. Like he Pacific Crest. Yes, yeah, so he's yeah. walked all of them. He's, he's wow. the Triple Crown, Triple awesome. Crown guy. Yeah, yeah. And what he was telling us is, you know, when you guys talk about the desert, I don't think you realize how big it is. Yeah. He goes, the, the reason we don't find the bodies is because there's just incredibly, unimaginably l large areas of uninhabitable land. Totally. Yep. He yeah, also yeah. pointed out, and this is true, This is, in episode one, I said, and you didn't correct me on this, so I blame you. I said repeatedly and with conviction that Martha's Vineyard is in Long Island. You did? I did. <laughs> oh, man. Yep. Yep. That one right over my head. Yeah. So you, you just, you didn't <laughs> think I was that uninformed. Martha's Vineyard, though, apparently is somewhere else because it's obviously in Rhode Island. It's in Rhode Island. It's not or Massachusetts. It Mass Sorry, Massachusetts. I can see it from Rhode Island from my uh, from my dad's family. This place. this goes to Mass my general theory. This this exchange <laughs> right now, which is nobody in America knows where wealthy people live. Man, yeah, yeah. Like nobody knows. Just how they like Martha's it. Martha's Vineyard. What a name! It's like it's like those people live with grapes. <laughs> yeah, so it's off the Cape. It's off the Cape yeah. in Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, almost in view of Long Island on yeah. like a super, super clear day. I'd said it's, but it is on Long Island Sound. Mm, no, no, nope. no, but it's I next to so. it though. Yeah. It's next to it. Definitely. I feel like <laughs> if I didn't know where it was, I, I did pretty well on my SATs. Okay. <laughs> you know, I even took SAT twos. No, I don't no ACT I don't, though. I, I don't think the what? ACT? What's that? Oh, is that not everywhere? That was in, in North Carolina. I took the no, ACT. No, also. I was in North Carolina. Yeah, it's like similar to I'm the... I, I know what it is, but we never took it when I was... You were oh, younger weird. than me. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I, my, my point is, I don't... When Ron DeSantis is like, I sent her to Martha's Vineyard, I think in people's minds when they hear that, I don't think they knew where that was. 
Yeah, that's fair. I, I'm going to yeah. go ahead and say it's not my ignorance that's the problem. Yeah. I think it's generally people had no idea where it was, which makes the whole exchange funnier. They're like, where did Dunk on Martha's Vineyard, that place in Tennessee? What is it? I, I meant to kind of come back and throw this in another episode. And I should probably fact check this again first. We can cut it out if I'm completely wrong. I think they were dropped off in Martha's Vineyard in front of Camilla's house. That was a second drop off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she, isn't she in D.C.? I think she has a house in Martha's Vineyard. And they Does were she? Dropped off. Yeah, we should fact check that. But I'm pretty sure they were dropped off in front of her house. In Mar- in Martha's they Vineyard. they were, but I, I'm not sure if it's Martha's Vineyard. Yep, Martha's Vineyard. This uh, let's see if my phone is Martha's this. Vineyard an island. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It is. Um. Yep. DeSantis, Abbott, send migrants to Martha's Vineyard, VP's home. Very close to Obama's uh, home on, on Martha's Vineyard as well. I've got so many questions. <laughs> I've got so many questions. Now, I'm not, I'm not somebody that follows <laughs> news regularly because I think it poisons the mind. But it's, uh, it's odd to me that uh, the wealthiest Americans... And uh, the current VP and like former presidents live on a small island. It's just it's too great with Kamala. Do not come. Do not, do not come. come. And then they like, just he yeah he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He owned he owned the libs with that one. Do, do not do not come. Yeah, yeah. Do, <laughs> do you think do you think Kamala gets home to her house and shit and, they and came the shit. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good lord, yeah. Should have uh, hit. Should have hit him with a third repeat on that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah, we should have. We should have. We should, okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Let's start this episode. We are going to. We have two kind of main stories. This is episode seven. We're recording this sometime in February. Uh, what's our main story? Tell us about our main story. Main story. We're talking about um, specifically about Afghan migrants into the U.S. Um, and the Darien Gap, kind of as our as our background, which is a. Uh, uh, no man's land between Colombia and Panama. Yeah. So, so right now we kind of have a, um, we have a, a three headed beast of locations that, um, I think everybody following or wanting to understand global immigration should know. So Malia, which we covered in our early episodes, which is, uh, a Spanish town on the coast of Morocco. Right. 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 Uh, we have Christmas Island or Nauru Island. Right, which is where Australia sends a lot of folks wanting to come to Australia, and we have this Darien Gap, which, as we'll learn today, is a sort of uh, literally used to be a no man's land, right? Connecting Panama to the rest of South America, and has now become a, a very important route for migrants, right? Right, right. from all and, over the world, and then this route leading right into the 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 real death valley as it's as, as it's called in texas that we talked about um in the yeah. last episode um so yeah kind of just these different bottlenecks different uh, like hot points and, and um, already this is episode seven that we're filming we're starting to see a structure for uh perhaps like a geographic set of touch points that we can use to be really informed when talking about the global movement of people because one thing that's uh, become apparent to me with with uh, every episode that you've prepared and that we've talked about is that there really are critical areas that and, and very specific geographic points that need to be understood to right. be able to tell a story. Right. Right. Okay. So that's very cool. But, but, and this is, it's been such a funny, bizarro world week uh, in immigration news. We have three stories today. It's been such a funny few weeks in the news that have introduced new phenomena into the encyclopedia of uh, immigration, specifically within the United States, okay? Yeah. And so the, the, the theme of these new stories is new immigration phenomena. And I, do you mind if I start? Because I, I found this no, one. please okay. go for it. So uh, we are here in Connecticut, and uh, there's a story that popped up from the Connecticut Post which says uh, Connecticut asked cities and groups to practice, quote, mass migration preparedness. The idea is 
that state officials have reached out to cities to get prepared for new migrant busing situations. Uh, right. That we've talked about before with Governor Abbott, Ron DeSantis, I'm guessing uh, other governors will follow suit from the South. Yep. And the Connecticut Department of Social Services made this request specifically on a panel on, quote, mass migration preparedness. Eli, I think, if I'm reading this correctly, migrants are now being treated like weather events. <laughs> uh, folks, uh, tomorrow morning, between the hours of 8 and 11 a.m., uh, bring your umbrellas because it's going to be uh, raining uh, Nicaraguans, Mexicans, Hondurans, Afghans, 5% Chinese, uh, intermittently, look out for the uh, big clouds full of buses from the south. Uh, you need to be prepared. This is, again, a all-hands-on-deck uh, warning for mass migration preparedness. Like, what? what is this yeah. language? Yeah, it's going to be like the new uh, trade winds, you know, that people used to use to cross the Atlantic. You know, the trade winds in the global village. We're going to have a... Downpour of Haitians on, uh, in South Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Board up your windows, folks. There is a uh, there. Uh, there's going to be a uh, strong winds carrying uh, Haitians uh, going through the town square between the hours of one and four. Doesn't that yeah. sound crazy? Now th this is nominally from a progressive organization, and I and I get it, but I feel like I don't know mass migration preparedness might create alarm in some people because it, it does really make it sound inevitable. It makes it sound like uh, mass migration is not the, re uh, of this sort of busing is not the result of human action, right. but it, it's literally uncontrollable and inevitable like the weather. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You made a, you made a point about, you know, an immigration decision in in one nation being like a butterfly flapping its wings and that's right in the Amazon, right? Where's the um, butterfly here? I was going to say Congress, but they don't do shit on immigration. So the executive, I don't, yeah. I think the butterfly here is probably still Australia, right? So when Australia decided under like way back under Greg Abbott that it was going to usher in a modern age of moving migrants, uh, of actually in the moving migrants to an island like Nauru. Mm. So moving them away from their country, it brought this wave of ideas into let's call it the West, Yeah. first into Europe, specifically into Denmark, that we could move migrants that were coming into a country out to some far off hinterland. Mm. And then that eventually became the conservative idea and it made its way to Greg Abbott and Ron DeSantis. And, and the now, UK. And the UK, yeah. right? Yeah. Who yeah. Last, last episode we talked about you, you, uh, the Rwanda decision being finalized. And now we're at a point where those decisions far from actually solving the migrant crisis and yeah. or if it's even a crisis far from solving migration right have turned people's expectations of what migration is into such an abstract proposition that even progressive politicians are equating the arrival of migrants to unpredictable weather patterns yeah it's fascinating yeah <laughs> And so if I, so I'm a Connecticut, uh, an immigration lawyer in Connecticut. I'm actually barred in North Carolina. Those of you who don't know when you practice immigration, it's federal law mostly. And so you can practice anywhere. If somebody asked me to be on this panel, I think I'd decline. I think I'd go, you know what? This is a crazy, crazy thing to accept. Yeah. Because this is not the weather. You right. know where this is coming from. It's coming from politicized migration as entertainment decisions made yeah. by key figures. And you shouldn't be doing mass migration preparedness. You should be fucking suing. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And you should be going to your political leaders and saying, we fucking are going to sue Florida and Texas. And we're going to talk to the Biden administration until this stops. Yeah. Because if you accept this and this becomes normal things just continue to spiral. Right. As in, we just continue not getting together at the federal level through the Congress to actually fix a system that can't be fixed by just executive action and 
uh, political maneuvering. That's what I think this represents. Yeah, and just such a swift departure from any type of ownership. You yes. Know? You know, just like uh, this This is, uh, you know, something that is happening to us now, not something that we're participating in. Um, I'd turn it down, too. I, I don't think I'd sit on this panel. I mean, I... Yeah, it really boggles my mind. Um, trying to imagine like what the what the feeling in that in that room was, um, but yeah. well meaning. No, exactly. That's why it's so strange. Well meaning, equally dehumanizing is the right you, in, in a way. Do you, and, and we're close to Martha's Vineyard, right? I know that. <laughs> do do we, we know that? <laughs> yeah. I, I I know we can get there in three hours, probably. Right from from yep. Central Connecticut. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. So. I mean, they saw Martha's Vineyard and somebody in Martha's Vineyard was like, yeah, we were unprepared. Yeah. And we had this mass migrant event. They started abstracting the language mm. and that's worked its way down the coastal, you know, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut areas. And well-meaning Northeasterners are like, all right, well, we're not going to get screwed again. We're going to be prepared for the next mass migrant event. Right. And it's, it's well-meaning. But it gives, I think, uh, Ron DeSantis exactly what he wants. And, and it's 100%, silly and it's kind of like it's silly like it okay so let's let's just tie this in so there's this other story and i want you to cover this one because you were born in rhode island no i've had i've had family there almost my, my wife life. was born in rhode island oh Pro- really okay. providence okay okay yeah and her her father had a ministry there once upon a time okay so so tell us this next and again the theme of these three stories are new phenomena in the uh, immigration space um that that we're just trying to kind of talk about okay go ahead yeah so this this phenomena um involves gofundmes for coyotes for the animal not the animal uh for you know the the language around this is uh the right would say gofundmes for human traffickers yeah and the left would say gofundmes for um you know people who are saving lives yeah um and that's all another conversation we can have. What what is a coyote? I think they do. Um, you know, they get, they provide a public service on on one hand uh, for people who are running for their for their lives. Um, that that's pretty undeniable to me. Um, and they also, as to generalize, um, brutalize people and you know, maim, rob, rape, murder. A lot of people um, listening to this may not know what you're saying when you say what, like literally, what is a coyote? So, so a coyote is uh, when somebody wants to cross the border, wants to cross a border. A coyote is somebody that they hire uh, to smuggle them across, essentially. And uh, are these lone individuals? Uh, they're yes and no. There's there's fairly large organizations of coyotes, um, really highly. Um, organized groups actually especially around the mediterranean like we've been talking about um and probably the southern u.s border as well um all the way down to um individuals or groups of two or three um who are communicating on on walkie talkies um so it really runs the gambit i think so i've probably in my career which is almost seven years long here probably done and i used to do free intake clinics Mm -hmm. okay yep and as part of the intake clinics, I would, when I was talking with undocumented um, people, I would ask for how they got here. Right. Because, um, not because I was, purely because I was curious, but because knowing how someone got here helps you identify an admissibility factors, right? right. right? You know, yeah. were, they, were, they, were they helping smuggle? Yeah. Would they be accused of helping smuggle someone? But also understanding that story is actually critical for certain applications like military parole in place. Right. And the coyote stories that I heard really, like you said, run the gamut. But uh, a common thread is that it's not you, it's not like you're working with one coyote. Right. Right. It's a network. And you have yep. specialized you know, individuals. So you have somebody, you usually have a contact in a hometown or home village yep. that uh, is they are known as the coyote yeah and that person a lot like will organize the bus and they organize the bus and they bring you to the next checkpoint and then um, eventually inevitably you work with coyotes who are part of organized criminal gangs that control territory right right 
And so you have launcher coyotes, coyotes who specialize in taking you on a boat into international waters, kind of doing a loop, right. you know, and coming back in. You have coyotes that specialize in taking you across the desert, and then you have the coyotes that specialize in moving you from place to place inside of the United States. Right, right. Right, yep. usually in vans with like, you know, tinted windows, and then bring you to quote unquote safe houses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, until you reach your final destination. Right. I've also, uh, and then the networks, the digital networks are arguably even more organized to the point where I've had several clients who continue to receive bills, invoices yeah, uh, for trips taken on credit. Yeah. Right. So you take a trip. So you say, okay, it's going to be $15,000. We understand you can't pay, but when you work in the United States, when you work in whatever it is, you're going to pay us over a period of years and here's the interest rate. And you would get your invoice through WhatsApp. Hmm. Right, and then you would go, and you would go into like a local store that has, um, uh, like you, a wire, like uh, a wire, wire type, money, yeah. And, yeah. and and you wire the money. And if you weren't mm. paying, um, I've also had clients who would receive very serious threats, like yeah. you know, showing like severed limbs, like this is what's going to happen to you. Wow, yeah, you know, and um, that is, that is what a coyote, yeah, 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 uh, is. It's really a whole industry. Mm. at this point okay yeah this that that's small uh so i've heard i've heard about credit systems obviously people get robbed on the way also yes. so credit becomes a necessity um this this story sending uh bills years later that's that's kind of new to me uh, okay so but this is why this is crazy to me yeah okay again somebody has a heart of gold okay and this assistant vp and teacher was soliciting money on was it on gofundme yeah, so this was Mount Pleasant uh, High School in Rhode Island. This this immediately got snatched up by the culture wars and has kind of become national news yeah. um, recently. Um, yeah, this this VP circulated, I believe it was an internal email to um, to teachers, assistant teachers. Um, I'm assuming it wasn't students because it was a high school. Um, but basically starting this GoFundMe for a student who was, I think, had paid... 2000 of their $5,000 bill to this coyote um, or 3000 of the 5000 needed to raise $2,000. So she circulates this email uh, saying, look, the student in our community needs our help. Um, here's the GoFundMe link. Um, and massive backlash followed. Okay. Um, There's a good amount of naivete here. Yeah. Right. Again. Uh, okay. So in this teacher's mind, I don't, I don't know. I, I can't read their mind. Yeah. I don't, but I'm betting that if, if it's most people I talk to who don't work in immigration, don't work in enforcement, law side, advocacy side, yeah, who aren't immigrants themselves that work with coyotes and immigrants are very sophisticated about coyotes. She thinks, okay, this is like Miss Coyote who helped the student through. It's a single person. Yes. Yeah. Right. We're yeah. going to raise this money. The person's going to get it. And it's just like, okay, it's just a transaction. I'm going to abstract it. I'm going to abstract it. It's a transaction. They're going to get the money and the student's good to go. Right. I was like, no, this coyote again, I just said it. It's an industry. Right. There are many, there are whole groups behind this person that, that, that help this person come up. So at best, at best, you pay that money. Maybe that student's off the hook. Maybe they're not, though. Maybe they're uh, a victim of human trafficking, and what you really need to do is get them to a human trafficking clinic. Right. Okay. Right. And maybe that's what happens here. But at worst, well, you tell me. What do you think the worst case scenario is? What what, what what's she doing? Like, if I if I had to push you a little bit, do do you see a negative side to to raising money and? I could really, see, I could really see this uh, going both ways. Personally, do I see a a negative side of supporting the student doing that? No, I probably would have given money. Um, yeah. In this individual scenario, do I see a problem with the proliferation of this type of outreach and you know school communities and whatnot uh, to support the payment to these vast arrays of coyotes? Uh, maybe. Okay, hold on. I, yeah. Give me a sec. Thanks so much uh, having me on the show. My name is uh, <laughs> Coyote. Coyote. Mr. Impressive Coyote is my name. Um, 
you will be you are the principal of uh what's the name of the school mount uh, pleasant high mount school pleasant yep yep um on behalf of myself and uh my organization all coyotes i'd like to thank you um your largesse and your organization <laughs> on uh, behalf of your student has resulted in the fastest payment of a debt from a person under 21 that we have ever seen in our organization and uh, we've decided to learn from this we've decided to learn from this and uh, from now on uh, we just want you to know and again this is a thank you we are going to be sending everybody under the age of 21 who it needs the help of adult Americans like you um, into the US with QR codes with pre-designed GoFundMe pages <laughs> for coyote debts. Uh, we do recognize this as uh, the future of our esteemed organization. <laughs> and I just want to tell you first, is, is there anything I can uh, bring back to the big boss over here? Yeah, so this is a serious question. I'm wondering if your if your daughter knows where her her wolf mask is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> this is encouraging, uh, you know, illegal payments. First of all, uh, on the other hand, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> really. uh-huh. <laughs> but did you? I mean, were you satisfied? Uh, we we did send you, you know, a receipt once you paid off the bill. Were you satisfied? With the level of service we provide? <laughs> uh, I mean, he got that. All right, all right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Seems like I've left you I've left you at a loss for words. Okay. I, these are innovative organizations. They're businesses. Yeah. Right? If something yeah. like this comes, uh, uh, there is an uh, unintended effect, but there's also a, a pretty predictable effect because we see it. We see it with these criminal smuggling organizations where if there's a way to make money, right, they'll jump on it. And so um, I'm not saying the teacher is responsible for this, but I am saying that digital tools of payment, uh, these new networks are creating new phenomena like this, which can feed back. And this this is kind of maybe backing into like a pull factor argument though, which, which I think in general, I don't. I have a, I have a much different, uh, uh, it's not a pull or push for me in this case. It's a network argument. Okay. 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 So, uh, if you build these maps of, we, we have these, uh, studies that can be done where you tag like a dollar or a Mm. currency and you can do it, tag a digital currency piece. You can tag a physical one. And what it allows you to do is kind of get an idea of how far the economy of a certain region extends. Oh, interesting. Because yeah. you map yeah. where that dollar stops right. on average. And so if you do these maps of the United States, uh, in the past we've seen that the Midwest is the most clearly defined economic region in the U.S. because Midwestern mm. businesses and people like to do business with Midwestern businesses and people. Their money doesn't go far outside of it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So yeah. they have very clear lines. Other regions have lines, but they're not as clear as the Midwest. Another interesting example is China-Taiwan. Mm-hmm. So when you trace money between China and Taiwan – mainland China, Taiwan, they look like one country. Hmm. Okay. There is, yeah. they're, they're so economically tied in that there is no border. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what's the push-pull factor for that dollar? It's no longer a push-pull factor. It's everything so interconnected. It's networked right. in. I think that smugglers, and I think that these economies of uh, migration are actually becoming networked into the United States. Hmm. And into these key regions. Yeah. Right. They're becoming yeah. networked in. And so it's not a push or pull factor. It's actually something stronger. I don't know if it's a network factor of whatever it is. Right. Okay. And, yeah. and, and that's why this is interesting to me. So there's no blame to be put on the teacher. It's just they're reacting to the world as it is. Right. And the world right. as it is, is we have this crazy situation where you can choose to create a GoFundMe or to like wire money over to a coyote. That's insane. Yeah. Okay. So th- that's yeah. my point. I yeah. wanted to highlight that because then you have that along with this mass migration preparedness and um, immigration has entered our consciousness and uh, is both more abstract and more easy to interact with. Right. 
in that right. abstract world. It's super interesting. Okay, so, and so this is then the third story, and then we'll, this is just a quick one. But there's this clean new story you highlighted of um, a, a, kind of a, a collection of stories of Americans fleeing the U.S. for fear of, you know, maybe far-right violence. And uh, tell, tell us just a little bit about that. Yeah, so this is this is kind of an inverse of what of what we talk about um, in a lot of cases, and um, is maybe kind of the first telltale sign of, of our uh, the situation at our southern border, just uh, transposing itself onto the Canadian border in like two hundred years. Um, and you you know, I mean, after after Trump is elected, you heard it all over the place. You know, I'm you know I'm leaving the U.S. if he's elected because of blah blah blah. This this is becoming a reality for a lot of people who are feeling um, legitimately threatened. Um, and yeah, so the the story that I found was was really interesting. It's it's set after the wake of Dobbs, and it starts with this. Uh, it's a New Republic article. Um, it opens with this with this man in New York City. Um, walking to the German consulate to apply for citizenship um, because he's afraid of the waning protection for LGBTQ uh, plus individuals in the U.S. after Dobbs. Um, and really um, seeing like a lot of people are that the political far right sites are really set on um, these protections next. Um, Okay. Do you okay? And then there's this other note where there's this movement of Black Americans, and this is a quote called Blacksit, B L A X I T, which is a crazy, stupid name. But um, and it has a huge uptick in internet searches in the last year since the Trump administration. And uh, you know the the question becomes like, are these really? For me, is like, are these really new? Right. Yeah. I th- I think with um... Liberia exists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I, 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 I think with black Americans uh, moving abroad, I think this absolutely exists and, and can be traced back to really uh, Marcus Garvey. And we talked um, about most deaf in one of the episodes and, right. and the world passport. Right. And this right. kind of sovereign citizen movement. Right. And, and, and throughout American history, we can see um, why this has been a prevailing mm-hmm. um, movement. Uh, the the kind of new adherence to, to this way of thinking are, are people who are kind of newly threatened under um, legal frameworks that the, that the Supreme Court is threatening, I think, after, after Dobbs. Um, so I, but we saw an uptick in this. We saw an uptick in this before. Like George W. Bush, people wanted to go to Canada. Trump got elected. I put up a video about, you know, five countries you can go to got thousands of hits. Right. Yeah. This periodically happens. But here's, I'm going to just point out one thing. A United States is one of the only places where you can just think, be like, hmm, what country do I want to move to? Let me just Google it. Let me see what's best for me. And I'll just walk up to the embassy and just like apply to go there. Yeah. Right. There's a freedom to it where us as Americans moving abroad, and we'll talk about this in another episode, expats versus immigrants. Mm-hmm. It's you, you, you feel like you have the ultimate agency. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. so that's an interesting phenomenon that Americans are actively pursuing that. I agree. Right. And that, that's what makes it interesting. Yeah. But then like uh, migrants coming here, it's totally abstract. And it's like the weather, mass migration, preparedness, yeah. which is super interesting to me. And what's the other one? And, uh, you know, funding coyotes. Right. Like we, we yeah. have to fund this coyote like we have no other choice. I mean, look, the GoFundMe is right there. And then this person's going to be free. It's like totally abstract and uninformed. But like. We feel we have ultimate agency to go abroad. And to me, it feels there's some playground aspect to this where none of it seems like reality Hmm. because you don't have ultimate agency to go anywhere because, hell, you don't know the languages of most places. You can't work everywhere. You're not qualified. If you tried to move into the majority of countries, you would have a shit life unless you were already previously wealthy, at least for a while. True. You'd have to work into it. And so I don't think the majority of Americans are going fucking anywhere. Because, yeah, I mean, what, what are you going to do? Definitely. definitely. What are you going to do? It's, yeah. And, and uh, if we accept that the majority of Americans would leave, then we're actually um, going to be conflicting with something we've been saying here, which is that people are being forced to leave. <laughs> like you, a lot of really bad shit has to happen before people actually leave. Like you have to run out of water. There has to be war. There yeah. has to be complete destruction of your home. 
by and large, political fluctuations that aren't a clear, present, and proven danger of death yeah. are not going to cut it. Yeah, I mean, this is interesting. You can cut it. You can cut it both ways. Um, on one hand, on one hand, this type of claim, um, especially for LG, LGBTQ plus people, um, doesn't make any sense because the U.S. Um, is one of the safer nations for people experiencing the safest, the safest for people experiencing this type of persecution. Um, it's it's basically an automatic win asylum case from from a lot of countries, um, but. There's been over 300 anti-trans and LGBTQ bills um, in different states, over 300 since, um, not since, sorry, in, in 2022 alone that were introduced. Um, we've seen what's been accomplished with Dobbs. We don't, you know, think the, the extreme right's slowing down anytime soon. So there's, I don't think it's completely illegitimate, but I think it, it does. Um, I, I, it does over dramatize kind of the. I, I don't think it's over legitimate. Uh, I just don't think it's going to come to anything right now. There's there's nothing sure. pushing yeah. people out right now. So so it's like yeah. it's a story, but it's in a weird way. It's a fantasy story. It's like I just might. <clears throat> I might leave. Now if things get bad, oh, I'm going to leave. I'm going to have a magical life in this new place. It's going to be mm. amazing, and things here are going to suck, and you're going to see that you made the wrong choice by staying. I'm staying right now. But I'm going to leave, and it's going to be amazing, and I'm going to build a new business over there, and then I'm going to collect, connect America with this new place, and I'm just going to be like an outside writer, an agitator. It's, it's fantasy. Yeah, yeah. And when it's not, we know. Because when it's not, you get stories. You're like, hey, fucking half a million Russians just left in the past three months. Hmm. You know, they didn't hmm. sit there talking to reporters about how they were going to do it. Hmm. They didn't sit there debating it. You don't sit there and debate it. You fucking go because the danger is there. And mm. I say this as somebody who had to fucking go. So so in a way, it kind of uh, cheapens actual immigrants' experiences. 100 fucking yeah. percent is how I feel yeah. about this. Yeah. Okay. I, I just read yeah. this and I just see something like, oh, I'm going to leave. Oh, don't you, don't you, don't you consider Dobbs in six years? Because then in year seven, I'm going to pack my bags and I'm going to go to a place that's not too hot, but not too cold. <laughs> And I'm going to learn German. I'm going to learn German every day on Duolingo until the next Dobbs drops. I swear, don't you do it. That's what the fuck I think it sounds like. Mm. All right. Yeah, that's that was an interesting term for the story. Cause yeah, your your family actually... Uh, we're refugees. We yeah. have to, to bounce. Yeah. We weren't like, we really want to go. We were like, a fox or Evo surrounded that. Get us the fuck out. And yeah. dad was like, uh, spoke up against Milosevic, you know, yeah. in, a, in an army dinner. And they were like, oh, we're going to kill you. And I was like, I better get the fuck out of here. <laughs> we're like, yeah, you better go. You know? Yeah. You know, that that's how it really happened. Okay. Hmm. All right. Darien Gap. Let's get to our main yeah. story. Yeah. Darien Gap. And I'll take all the heat for whatever that voice was yeah, that I was, was doing. I was, I'll, I'll take all the heat. I was going to say, yep. Yep. All right. No. Don't right. you do it. <laughs> Don't you put out Dobbs 2. I swear to God, if that comes out in seven years, I'm going to leave. Don't you fucking do it. Let it come. <laughs> <laughs> Let him come. Get on your fire retardant lawyer costume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, yep. All right. <laughs> Darien Gap, the migrant route of last resort. Just one last point on that story. Yeah. I'm not saying that LGBTQ people aren't discriminated against. What I am saying yeah. is that we know, we fucking know, that when LGBTQ plus people are discriminated enough to leave, it's not subtle. It's not, uh oh, Dobbs is coming. I better go to the German consulate and ask about my citizenship and find the best <laughs> fucking place to live. Uh oh. It's not it. It's like, oh, fuck. Three dudes showed up at my door yesterday. Yeah. They beat the shit out of my family looking for me. They said they're going to kill me, or they did come in and beat the shit out of me. Yeah. And I have to leave because I'm going to die tomorrow. Right. Yeah, no, I was, it's it's taking a little bit for your point to settle in with me, but I've I've worked on enough of these um, asylum claim cases, um, sexual orientation claim cases, um, and seen enough, heard about enough 
horrific trauma that that people have gone through um to get here and claim that protection um that there is a whiff of trivial trivialization um in, 70 in, people on my tiktok inverse. told me that maybe i was just overdoing it yeah exactly. and i need to leave yeah 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 yeah, I, yeah no, it's, I, it's a yeah. different thing it's 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 a wholly fucking different thing it is it is yeah and it's um and by the way like there's places in the u.s that you can feel really safe true yeah and i and i really yeah and it doesn't mean that I have to let all the assholes off off the hook um, who are really making this their, their that's right this is real in the, that's in, right in the U S they're making this their life's work to take away these that's protections right. you, for people have, they would they would take away gay marriage tomorrow keep if they them could. on the hook and advocate that's what America is about but I just and yeah. these stories have like I have no they they have no traction in my heart yeah yeah yeah. yeah. no it's it's a completely different uh, and they trivial level. they trivial and, and they make it harder. To actually make the case for real asylum migrants. That's true, actually. If this movement really picked up steam and there was actually kind of a mass exodus um, of LGBTQ people, um, yeah, it would make those asylum claims harder for people who are um, actually running for their... Who, who, it could. It, it could. could. Yeah. yeah. So it, or at yeah. least, at least yeah. the public perception of them. So, right. so, let's, uh, so now let's move to part two, Eli. The Darien Gap. The Darien Gap, um, another horrific migration bottleneck that I had never heard of. Yeah. Um, kind of like the the border wall in Malia, um, the real Death Valley, as it's called in, in Texas. Yeah. Um, Naru Island. Naru Island. And as we um, talked about at the top of the show. Right, right, exactly. So, so, so the Darien Gap, I essentially backed into this story as well, um, looking at, at Afghan migration. I sent you the country. story. Yes, you sent me the on on. I do some work on this podcast. I <laughs> sent you this. Yeah. You did, yeah. It was it was a fantastic article, and through researching um, Afghan migration um, into the U.S. via this route, I I started to hear about the Darien Gap and dug into it a little deeper. Um, essentially, what it is is sixty miles of of roadless jungle, really steep mountains, um, rivers, swamps, um, in between Colombia and Panama. Um, it is the only place that the Pan American Highway does not cross, so it's actually not a continuous highway from from Alaska to tip of Argentina. Um, they couldn't cut it through there. Um, this chunk of land defeated the Spanish back in the day. Um, they, Holy shit! It defeated the Spanish. Yes, yeah, it did. Uh, and at at the time, they were really feeling themselves. Are we talking uh, Ents? Ents, ancient tree-like. Oh yeah, creatures. Maybe. Ants, yeah. That fought in uh, yeah, that, on Middle Earth. That could have been it. Yep. That definitely could have been it. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it. so the, the Spanish who, were, mm. who controlled almost every square inch of Central America at one point or another um, steered clear of this area. Um, too dense, too sleep. Um, a lot of malaria, yellow yeah. fever, um, lots of poisonous animals, uh, snakes specifically. Um, and what's happened over time, this... This area really did used to be a, a no man's land. Um, there are various indigenous groups who may have like lived under the radar there for way longer than uh, people realize, um, but it was empty for a long, long time. And as land and air routes um, for migration into Central America um, and eventually to the U.S. have been clamped down on more and more, um, it's funneled people into the Darien Gap more and more. So the like a lot of the numbers are seeing in, in the Mediterranean and globally in general, um, there's been a huge spike of people who are trying to make this, this journey. And it is. And what's interesting, and I, and I hope we can put this at least in some of our shorts, um, this article by the AP, I believe, by several of their reporters, uh, followed the trip of one Afghan man in particular who had filmed much of it. And he provided a lot of video of passing through the Darien Gap on canoes across yeah. kind of these dense jungle paths. Yeah. And to me, it's fascinating that the sort of heart of darkness in South America it all of a sudden is illuminated by yep. modern technology. Right. And it and yeah. it brings images from that again into our homes. Right. Yeah. Just like the GoFundMe's that we talked about, you know, 
GoFundMes from coyotes and mass migration events. It's it's no longer push or pull. You're 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 networking the images of these journeys mm. into the minds of mm. people elsewhere. Might I say it's dare I say it was entertaining to watch, and that is the most dangerous thing that can happen in America is for something to become entertaining. So true. Yeah. Just right. ask those in charge during Vietnam, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Same, same type of thing. Same type of thing. Yeah. Right. That's a very good thing. Yeah. So could you see influencers being like, you know what I totally want to do? I totally want to take this IG to the Darien Gap. Oh my God. Did you see the sunset behind the canoe when those migrant fellows were just like making <laughs> their way on the river? Can you imagine me just sitting there with my bare chest and just... Ugh, I just feel like we'd get at least a thousand likes a day. Yeah, the clout. The clout. Yeah, the clout would come the pouring. The Darien in. Gap clout effect. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Darien Gap. Oh my Hashtag God. but I have a passport. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag don't need a visa. Yeah. Hashtag immigration justice. <laughs> <laughs> Could you see it? Yeah, I mean uh, some of the best the best articles I found on this uh, were, were photojournalism because you can't really get a, a picture for this until you see it. Um, it's really, really harrowing, really muddy, really steep. Um, I read this story of, you know, a pregnant woman making this crossing. Um, and yeah, there's, there's all kinds of kind of myth and lore about how, how difficult this crossing is. I think Jeep had like a campaign um, an ad campaign in the 90s, early 2000s, where they tried to drive like three other flagship, uh, you know, big badass, whatever the fuck they're called, across, and like one of them uh, didn't make it and is still like rusting out, and like people can still walk by it. Um, I think they're called Jeeps. Yeah, but it was like uh, their their special expedition Jeep that wasn't available to the got public. It. And it got That's, stuck in the Daring Gap. Got stuck. Couldn't make it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so th there's still no roads. It's completely controlled by gangs at this point. Um, and yeah, it's an unbelievably dangerous, um, harrowing part of the journey. Um, it's, re it's really the crux of of the journey, which is wild because, you know, people continue on um, – through so many other trials and tribulations, including, you know, La Bestia, the, the train in Mexico. And, um, yeah, so, so Darien Gap is really seen as kind of the crux here. And, and, uh -huh. and here's what was interesting to me about this. And this, this is, goes back to the language that we're seeing pop up in the United States of mass, what was it called? I'm going to get it right. Mass, mass migration preparedness. preparedness. Yeah. Okay. So it says in these, um, in your research here that towns along the way are being pushed into health emergencies. Right. Right. So there's a yeah. collapse of healthcare systems, for example, in Nacocli, Colombia, and a lack of food and water. Now, presumably, yeah. that's because the migrants themselves are needing care, right? They're falling yeah. down from exhaustion and yeah. sickness and injury. Yeah. And it's putting, um, and these, uh, and obviously, then one would say, in the language of America, the mass migration preparedness of these uh, towns along the route is not up to snuff. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. we, now, where is it up to stuff, though, right? Because the other thing we see, so you mentioned gangs, but also FARC and the Gulf Clan, Colombia's largest drug cartel, yeah. are in this area. And uh, But at the end of the route, it's interesting, uh, when you cross into Panama, what greets the migrants? Yeah, it's kind of, it, it's an interesting part of this journey. It's kind of a first little breath of, of fresh air for these individuals, I think. Um, it sounds like there's a little bit more... Um, uh, robust uh, support once they once they go into Panama, they're processed for the first time um, as refugees, giving mm -hmm. that designation. Um, and yes, yeah, so they get a little reprieve. There's a massive, there's a few, I think, massive um, migrant centers in Panama there that is um, that have gotten a little bit more adept at, at registering people and providing aid. What's interesting to me, I, lo I look at those images of those Panama soldiers. Yeah. Who greet the migrants? It's actually soldiers, and they're very calm. Yeah, and there are clear lanes as people come out of the jungles that people are set into, and they're given food and water, a place to rest, some sort of satellite Wi-Fi accessibility. Yeah, 
And you see this in the images from this actually one particular Afghani migrant. And it almost looks organized. Yeah. You know? And directly next to that jungle, yeah. It's, directly it's next to that jungle. And actually yeah. the whole effect of having phones on the jungle, um, it's like this uh, feeling that that itself is kind of civilizing the root, which mm. is totally fake effect. Right, yeah. Right? That, that That's why I'm saying influencers would be like, oh, this looks totally fun. Right, right. right. It kind of takes away from the... <laughs> yeah or I mean, nature of it doesn't it god there's this but, 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 yeah, but i don't yeah, want to get us too off topic because yeah. i do that a lot but yeah and so what's interesting to me you talk about mass migration preparedness that's what these soldiers represent right they've said okay these people are going to come mm-hmm. we have a balance to carry out between security and preventing loss of life right and our role, and Panama says our role in here, we know what our role is. Our role is to just be a waypoint mm-hmm. to save those we can in some limited way and to you know, get them on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which brings to mind another concept that I think will be interesting to follow on this podcast. So we're getting these geographic destinations that I hope will become a mark of how we talk, right? We're going to be talking right. Darien Gap. We're going to be talking Death Valley in California. We're going to be talking... Malia, Texas, 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 Texas. Texas, I'm sorry. We're going to be talking Malia. We're going to be uh, talking our island, as I've I've said repeatedly. Well, I hope we can also talk about transit countries, transit strategies, entry countries, and destination countries, right? right? Along the route, which is not the same thing as origin countries, which are where people leave from. Yeah. And there's a very different set of economies and expectations on origin countries entry countries pass through countries right and destination countries right that to me is fascinating i I, um i'd love to bring in if there are experts on any such thing but what we're seeing in panama is a pass through countries response right yeah i think what i'm learning slowly is that these these migration routes are more defined than i thought beforehand Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and often start way further back than than I would have imagined. Um, mm-hmm. It sounds like you have a little more experience because you've worked on the border and there's a little bit of tracking about how many countries people are coming through. Yeah, like I, like I like, said, a big part of my, when I had Fronteca, FronteraTech.org, we'd received a grant uh, from a large foundation, a half million dollar grant to develop and take technologies uh, using scan sheets, working with um, uh, a wonderful uh, tech company founded by two Stanford PhDs. And um, QED.ai, yeah. William Wu and Jie Hua Chen. And the idea was that we could intake people on paper and then scan things in. And so we kind of let intakes. But you realize very quickly, first of all, on the U.S. border, that you're getting people from all yeah. over the world, which wasn't immediately clear to me as a young lawyer. Yep. And you realize that these are not straightforward migrations. They're not short. So we would find Bangladeshi boys. I remember we found two Bangladeshi boys inside of the Charleston Detention Center in 2019 who were both 17. Mm. So eventually we got them out because you're not supposed to be detained under 18. Mm. But the reason there was some confusion about their age is they had four passports. Yeah. That were provided at their exit country of Bangladesh. And they needed four passports with four different visas, something like that. It was like multiple passports, multiple visas, because they went west. You know, they went through Mm. like Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, crossed over into the northeast tip of Africa, made their way to the Nigeria port. From the Nigeria port, they went to the Caribbean. From the Caribbean, they went to Brazil. Yeah. From Brazil, they probably went through the Darien Gap, which I didn't know of back then, but they definitely did because they had all they had the Latin to, American yeah. countries in Colombia and Venezuela. Yep. And, you know, they made it to the Mexico border. So they, yeah. and, and that number count of countries, I would say the average I was seeing was 11 or 12 countries that people were passing yeah. through. Yeah. Cameroonians fleeing Anglo Francophile, uh, Anglo Francophile violence, same thing, right? They're, they're coming to Nigeria, going to the islands, going to Brazil, and moving up, up, up. Yep. Yep. So, no, it's not uncommon. In fact, I think it's the standard, which is why I really, one of the big reasons I wanted to do this podcast is I was seeing that and it just, it wasn't making sense to me. I didn't have enough context for it. Right. And so I I really do, and I hope this is valuable to people who listen to these early um, episodes because we're, what we're really doing is creating a map and a way of talking about this because it doesn't really exist. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, so, uh so, but take us to the end of the Darien Gap. Yeah. So this, uh, 
like the numbers globally, um, like I said, this the numbers have, have ticked up in a huge way um, through the Darien Gap, um, like 200% over the last like five or six years. Afghanistan, uh, Af- 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 Afghan immigrants specifically have been choosing this route. Um, 88.5 thousand Afghans um, have been resettled in the U.S. Um, and since- all of those were, were before the pullout was completed. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and as time has gone on, it has been more and more difficult for asylum seekers from Afghanistan to go through the legal routes. Um, so more and more so, um, they've been pushed into these, um, into these different migrant routes, uh, specifically this one that starts in Brazil. So they actually start in Sao Paulo, cut across South America diagonally through, through Brazil. Um, to Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Darien Gap, Central America, Mexico, um, which is just an unbelievable journey. Um, last year, it was estimated that like 2,200 people um, came through, 2,200 Afghans came through the Darien Gap, um, a 30, 30 times more than 2021. So these numbers are really spiking right now. Um, and there's going to be more. And so yes, George yeah. Packer, writing for the Atlantic, did this amazing piece um, following what was happening to those Afghans who had worked with Americans and supported them in various roles, from working in the State yeah. Department to you know, being translators to whatever. Yeah. As the country was closing and as it became apparent that the Taliban were going to foil any hope that American administrators might have had of doing a withdrawn pullout. And, you know, the article follows the efforts of different Americans trying to help them, and but mostly of the Afghani families, like, rushing U.S. embassies trying to get on the last helicopters out, totally. right? Yeah. Like, make, yeah. showing a clear parallel between that and our pullout out of Saigon. And when it ended, you're left wondering, well, what the hell is going to happen to these people? Yeah. This goes to one of the themes you've been pushing, right? People are not passive actors. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if somebody's being passive about where they're going to go, they're full of shit. Yeah. Because things aren't bad enough yet. Yeah. Oh, Germany, I'm going to go there. Seven years, you'll see. You know, <laughs> it's not. No, what, what's happening is that these people who've been like very highly educated, highly motivated, highly endangered people are coming to the U.S. anyway. It's like, motherfuckers, I I'm worked coming. with you for 20 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to be here with these Taliban. Are you fucking out of your mind? Yeah. Okay. And there's also like the political will from the U.S. is disappearing at a rapid rate. Like since the Taliban takeover, um, there's been like 51,000 applications um, yeah. similar to, to the applications that were being approved left and right yeah. before. Um, of the 51,000 applied for since the Taliban takeover, 600 have been approved. And see, th- that's that's a question of, to me, it's not political will, it's institutional incompetence specifically at the department of state which for some reason has been behind the curve of uscis the department of labor other agencies involved in immigration and i have Mm. a i have a sense because they have a lot of anti-immigrant holdovers Mm. and they've really been fucking those afghanis like really hard that shouldn't be happening that's what it looks like that 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 shouldn't be happening and and that has been clear for at least since since the very pullout we've seen that wow Okay, wow. and, yeah. and and I, yeah. I think the Department of State is actually just the most uh, in trouble organization we have in, in yeah. the country. But that that's a conversation for another. Day. In fact, we should do a show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I want to then highlight the Darien Gap is critical to us, as it's critical to the world because it is one of the arteries through which the world is moving. Right. It is akin. Right? Okay. The Silk Road. Hmm. You know. Was the Silk Road possibly ever anything but a road full of merchants? Is it possible that the Silk Road was always a migratory route? Hmm. Right? Hmm. The Darien Gap right now contains uh, a lot of a lot of the cost we tried to outsource is coming back into the U.S. through the Darien Gap. That's another way to think about wow. it. Wow, yeah. Yeah. We want to ag- yeah. ignore those, af- close our eyes, we're out of Afghanistan. Well, guess what? You can't. We want to ignore our eyes about what's happening in Venezuela. Guess what? You can't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's why I think places like this need to be studied. Let's end it there. Yeah. Folks, I'll be transparent with you. 
he's got to go to class. This guy's still in law school. That's why we got to end it. Thank you so much for watching. Eli, any final thoughts? Thank you guys for watching. Thanks so much. See you in episode eight.